A very big welcome to everyone from a very grey day in London. I'm Shanaz Engineer. I'm the chair of the UKWZCC. So big welcome to you all. We are delighted to have Adal Dawa grace this webinar with his proven concept of open book entrepreneurship. Adal, after graduating from IIT Bombay and then University of Wisconsin, where he studied MS powder metallurgy, he joined Ocan Metal Powders and within 20 years became its president. He then led a um, leveraged management buyout to form AccuPowder. He sold that company very successfully in 2010. His major professional awards include IIT Bombay's Dix Distinguished Alumnus and Metal Powder Ind Industries Federation Metallurgy and he's a fellow of the Powder Metallurgy Association of India. Adil is an active Zagni member and was totally involved in the building of the new Diamere. Adil is a very active member of WZCC since its inception and has been its global president from 2015 to 2021. He received the WZCC Entrepreneur Award in 2004. Adel is passionate about promoting entrepreneurship within our youth and may it and may and long may it continue, sorry. Um, so over to you Adel, but before I do that, at present everyone is muted, but please put your questions in the, post your questions in the chat box. Thank you, over to you Adel. Uh, just to make sure you can hear me and you can see the screen. We can. Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, just a, a word about how today's uh, webinar came about. There was uh, something on the UK, uh, <clears throat> what, what you call a uh, chat box, and we were talking away on the, and um, the question came up about profit sharing and motivation. And I put a comment in and Dora Mistry picked it up and he said he reminded me about uh, open book management that I presented something at the 2005 AGM in uh, London. So he wondered if I'd like to do it again. And I said, definitely. So that's how it, it came about. Uh, so Okay. Um, uh, Yasdi, I'm. It's the slides is not moving forward. Anything I'm doing wrong? Just click on the right side of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the arrow is not working. So just. Okay. So just to. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about AccuPowder before we get into the main um, subject. In 1995, uh, I led a management buyout of Alcan Metal Powders to form AccuPowder International. Now, AccuPowder International is a manufacturer of non-ferrous metal powders. We made powders of copper, tin, bronze, brass, etc. Uh, these powders are sold for industrial applications, such as powder metallurgy, self-lubricating bearings, filters, structures, structural parts for automotive and home appliances, diamond tools, plasma spray, chemical catalysts, arts and graphics. So there's a lot of industrial products. We sold uh, business to business. Uh, PM self-lubricating bearings is a very big application and you probably all uh, use it without knowing it. Um, it's basically made by pressing copper and tin powders together, and you make a bearing which is porous, you sinter it so it develops metallurgical strength, and you fill this bearing with oil. So when the bearing works in, a, in your application, such as washing machines, dishwashers, 
uh, hand tools, automotive, uh, it doesn't require lubrication. You know, as the shaft runs, it, the part heats up, oil comes out, lubricates the shaft, then you shut it down by capillary action, the oil is pulled back in. So there's a permanent reservoir of, of lubrication. The another very common application is greeting cards. The, the gold that you see in greeting cards is actually flake brass powder, which is flaked and, and used as a pigment. Okay. Okay, so um, at the time when we purchased uh, the, the company, the annual revenues were about 50 million. We had 80 employees and it was a borderline profitable company. In good years, we would do well. In um, bad years, we would, we would do badly and it just carried on. We were a very small division of a very large international company, Alcan Aluminium. You know. So, um, <clears throat> Basically, uh, in the 80s, a, a new plant was built in Joliet, Illinois, making aluminum powder, uh, which I had gone to start and then came back to New Jersey. At that point, what was left in New Jersey was the non-aluminum um, products. And Alcan being an aluminum company, I saw the handwriting on the wall and approached them and said, look, if you, it doesn't strategically, this plant doesn't make sense for you. So if you're thinking about selling it, I would like to be interested in purchasing it. So they thought about it and said yes, and, and essentially said, look, it's a public company. We can't just sell it to you at any price. We'll get it appraised, and then you'll have first option to purchase it. And if uh, you can come up with the financing in three months, you've got it. If not, we'll put it up uh, for an open sale, and then you can try again at whatever price you want. So essentially the purchase uh, appraised price came out to 12 million. Uh, we thought about it. We couldn't really relate it much to the EBITDA, which is a con uh, very common way of measuring the valuation uh, because it was, you know, as I said, in good years, it made a little bit of profit and bad years it didn't. So it was a very low EBITDA, but had good assets. And we decided to, to go ahead uh, and uh, accept the offer. So we contacted a lot of banks and uh, really the banks that were interested were asset-based uh, lending uh, banks where you give, uh, they give you a certain percentage of your assets. Uh, we had good value in our land, our buildings, our equipment, our inventory. And then basically there was about a, a few million dollars which was uh, did not have any collateral and they gave it to us with what they call an air ball. And, and essentially we had to sign uh, personal notes uh, for it, you know. Uh, just to give you an idea that this was our, our symbol and an interesting story with just before we bought it, we said we needed a new logo. So um, partners got together and said, okay, let's have some pizza. We've got 45 minutes to come up with a new logo. We're not going to spend time with consultants or pay money for anyone or do anything. And this is what we came up. Uh, you see, uh, uh, A, we oh, Decided on the A because Alcan was always first in the listing. We wanted to remain there. Uh, the dotted materials is uh, uh, powder. Uh, it's copper colored. And if you are involved in chemistry, you'll realize that the capital C, small u, is the symbol for copper. So that's how we came up with a copper powder uh, company. And the globe indicates we are international. Uh, here's a picture of the plant. Uh, essentially, uh, it was a 10-acre site and a lot of uh, small buildings across the property because uh, powders is quite hazardous. Uh, very fine powders is, can uh, ignite, can explode, and uh, there was sub substantial risk in that regard. Um, a very old plant was started by Professor Hall of Columbia University in 1916. And the field that you see, the baseball field you see, was land uh, donated by uh, the uh, Alcan uh, at that time to the township for a little league field. So it's a very popular location. Uh, every weekend, the kids meet there. And when you want to give directions, you say it's a uh, plant is across Hall Stadium and, and that people immediately know where it is. Okay, so what were the risk factors when we started on our own? Uh, it was a borderline profitable company, old plant with environmental issues. We had a confrontational steel workers union. It was highly leveraged. 
for the $12 million, we put down only 200,000. So it was a debt to equity ratio of 60 to one. So the debt load was very heavy. So we couldn't afford for anything to go wrong. And if not, we would have a problem. A lot of the people advised us not to do it. They felt uh, it was uh, too many major risk factors. Um, but we had worked at the company. We knew what the opportunities for improvement were. And uh, we were willing to take the risk. It was a calculated risk. Uh, so we, uh, you know, particularly myself and uh, later on, I'd invited partners there, uh, all felt that uh, it was doable and we wanted to do it. So in spite of a lot of advice from naysayers, we went ahead. Okay, so what, so what were some of the things that we were going to do differently? And this was based on just experience and intuition. Okay, one was we were going to switch gears from being a division of a multinational company to a small private company. We're going to change from being corporate managers to entrepreneurial leaders. And there's a big difference between the two. Um, I could have kept 100% of the equity, but I felt that it was important to have committed people involved in the in the uh, endeavor. So seven key employees were offered equity in the new company. As far as the union, uh, equity didn't make too much sense for them because you don't really see the full benefits of equity till you leave the company. So we decided to uh, do two things. One was uh, give them job security and say that we're not going to be doing layoffs uh, day in and day out, which was sort of the way Alcan operated. It was quite common practice. We'll only do it if our company's survival was at stake. And we introduced what we called a profit sharing plan, and that was called an employee incentive award, and was implemented as a power powerful incentive and motivation vehicle. The old corporate model, if you want to call it, was it's not my job, that's your job. Employees do as they're told. Employees punch their brain out when they punch in. It's a narrow job. There's a confrontational we versus they, union versus management, frequent layoffs, and really employees at, at, in the production level, you know, essentially some of them, not all, uh, do the minimum to get by. But the momentum is, uh, the good workers see the bad workers doing little, and the momentum is towards less and less work. So what we be going to do different in, uh, and the new entrepreneurship model, uh, we said was we had the opportunity and we'd seized it. We had a clear shared mission, and, and that was that we would, you know, uh, basically our major stack Stakeholders would be our customers and our employees. Uh, shareholder value uh, was not a, a concern. And uh, our main objective was to perform well, but also to outperform our competition. Treat people with respect and dignity. Eliminate bureaucratic rules. Uh, being part of a large corporation, there was so many rules and sometimes you wondered how these rules came about, possibly because one or two people were bad actors and the rules got put in. So really, the, um, we wanted to just get rid of a lot of the bureaucratic rules and we did. Flatten the management structure. Really, we, it was completely flat. I had 12 people reporting to me um, in the old model every area would have a manager, uh, you know, like a production manager or a sales and marketing manager. And all they were doing was double guessing the people on, on the floor. So the production manager would double guess the production superintendents, the sales and marketing manager would double guess the, uh, you know, the area sales managers. And, and really, I, we felt that the people on where the action is know what's going on and we didn't need those middle managers. Now that's possible in a small company and that's what we did, really flatten the structure. Empower employees to impact their jobs, uh, wide jobs with flexibility, teamwork and motivation. And of course the big item that we had introduced is taken the success of the company. Now this was pretty much done, um, everything was done by, if you wanna call it a past experience and intuition. Uh, we had three co-equal priorities safety and environment, 
Now, this item was very well under control under Alcan. In the 1970s, uh, essentially, Alcan took safety very, very seriously. And we had a corporate safety and environmental person called Dick Riley, who had essentially toured the world. He, Alcan had plants in Australia, India, all, Malaysia, all over the world. And he became really my guru in the safety and environmental area. We started keeping track of lost time accidents, recordable case rate. Um, and we said every year where we had no lost time accidents, we would have a big luncheon uh, party with steak lunch. So this was very well entrenched and, uh, uh, and continued. Quality and service, uh, this was changed. Uh, you know, we used a, a phrase called when you dance with the customer, let, let them lead. And, and really uh, quality were very important to us. Um, for example, uh, we work with the customers and if the customer, uh, you know, if you shipped a product and it didn't work for some reason, even though it was in spec, we would send a customer service uh, person over and try to make it work. If it had, you know, if you had any problems, we just take the material back uh, without questions. And all we really incurred is the freight cost back and forth. Uh, we avoided any potential. A lot of our other uh, competitors and even with Alcan, they would say it needs specifications. You know, we're not going to take it back. So we really changed that policy of, of taking the product back if it didn't work, even though it met specification. Uh, we would ship materials out on the same day. If you got an order in um, before 12 o'clock, if it was in uh, material and inventory, we would get it out the same way. Samples, same way. People, a lot of our customers would want samples. And we would also, you know, had something new. We would like to work with them. So uh, we changed quite a bit there. Productivity, we had a little formula where the performance and productivity of an employee is based on the ability into motivation plus and minus the environment. Ability is aptitude into training. There isn't that too much you can do for the aptitude. It's natural ingrained in the person. Training you can offer, education you can offer. Uh, that improves the ability. Motivation, very critical item which a lot of people ignore, uh, is need into incentive. For the you know, key management, People, the need was uh, more to be part of uh, have equity, and that is what we offered. For the employees on the shop floor, equity didn't make sense, so it was a profit sharing plan. Okay, and the environment there refers to everything else, which means the lighting in the room, uh, the tools that you supply, uh, the, the mood of the individual when he, he comes into work. So everything uh, else goes into that. Our employee incentive plan. Um, basically, I started looking into, you know, what are other people doing? And we came across um, the Duck Boat Company in Boston, which at that time was doing a 20% of pre tax profit to all employees. I didn't find any company that was doing more than 20%. So we said, okay, we are going to do 20% of pre tax profits to all employees over and above all existing union contract, bonus awards, et cetera. We said, if you're going to do well, we're going to share our success. If you don't do well, we're all going to be without a job. So the formula was that this 20% kitty, suppose it came out to 100,000, 25% of that would be distributed equally to all employees. 25% would be distributed based on the salary level. The third 25% would be distributed based on length of service and the last 25% on departmental performance. So it involved a lot of, um, you know, keeping track of calculations, but it worked well. We would have a shop talk every three months and the company would uh, discuss the results and the EIA would be announced. At the end of the first quarter, we would announce it, but not give out anything because we didn't know how the balance of the year would be. At the end of six months, we would, have the six month figure and give out 50% of that. At the end of the third quarter, we would calculate the amount and uh, basically minus what was actually given out. Uh, we'll calculate 75% of it and uh, minus what was already given out and do the balance. And then at the end of the year, the entire amount would be calculated minus what was already distributed and paid out. 
Now, this became a, a, a fantastic item. Okay, people were talking about it and it was getting a lot of buzz. The other thing we did is we, we made basically the business, uh, you know, we made our day-to-day -day things uh, the game of business. We, we, there were a lot of people uh, at Acubado which came from uh, Europe, a lot of Portuguese immigrants were in our production department, a lot of Polish immigrants were in our maintenance department. Soccer was a big thing with them. And we would talk about soccer and baseball in almost everything we did, you know. Um, so we explained that as a game, that means, you know, each of us has a position. We've got overall rules that we have to play within, but we also have to be flexible. We have to pinch hit and pick up the other person's job when needed and teamwork and create teamwork, you know. Our continuous improvement was the name of the game. It didn't matter how good you were, how bad you were. We always wanted to improve. The big thing was outperform our competition, do lunch or be lunch. Keep scope, countless performance ratios. We had ratios all over in safety, uh, in, which I've already mentioned, lost time accidents, a recordable case rate, in quality, good time, um, first time good production, a number of customer complaints, on-time shipments, and in in uh, in manufacturing, uh, almost everything, performance, equipment, utilization, you name it. And every time people uh, broke a record, we would celebrate with it, okay? Uh, we even had a game where we would have people guess the amount of pounds we would ship in that month. And then we would give, uh, you know, anyone who came closest, there would be a $50 gift certificate. So. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but when we came up with the 20% profit sharing plan, we told the employees, go out and look for another company which is doing more than 20%. If you find any company doing more than 20%, let us know about it and you get a $50 certificate. So this encouraged them to talk about it with their family, with their friends, and the word will get out. So the bottom line was, let's do the talking. Uh, let the numbers do the talking, sorry, and the profits would, would follow. Okay, so in 19, about two to three years after we were in doing this, we came across a book called Open Book Management by John Case. And the book cover says, companies that practice OBM, open book management, seem to have captured some sort of lightning in a bottle. So as I mentioned a number of times, we went, Without knowing it, we were intuitively practicing OBM. However, one key item was missing. And that, not, that is that we had not provided formal business literacy education to enable employees to understand the relationship between what they did and the bottom line. So we spoke to a union college, which is a local community college in our area. And they had, uh, we selected a, a business professor and uh, we worked up a agreement with them where he would come actually to the plant and train all the employees and teach one-on-one business to everyone from the janitor up to even the management people had to participate in it. We would do it after shift. So suppose the shift ended at four o'clock, uh, the employees would stay over for two hours. We would pay them overtime a rate for attending the class. And essentially, uh, each one got about 30 years, or, uh, sorry, 30 hours of um, exposure to this course. And the results were like magic. Okay. Within five years, we bought another small competitor in Tennessee. Our volumes and market share had doubled to over 40%. We were about 19% when we started, and we were at 40%, and with the same number of employees. Okay, and it, it was really now some uh, employees would would it's too too much for them and they would sleep through the classes, but most of them, uh, I would say over eighty percent of them enjoyed it thoroughly and they would start using terms of, you know, inventory turns and days uh, outstanding and and uh, uh, basically gross profit and you know all sorts of uh, business terms. And I think they had a, a lot of fun with it. So to, to sort of uh, 
go over this open book entrepreneurship in a more formal way. Um, it's a what is it? Okay, it's a way of running a business that gets every employee focused on helping the business succeed and make money. Enables every employee to develop business literacy and understand the company's critical numbers and financials. Employees accept responsibility and are empowered to move these numbers in the right direction. Employees see themselves as partners in the business with a direct stake in the company's fortunes. So how, how does one implement it? First, provide a clear information and communication, shared vision, strategy, and tactics. And I've mentioned before, uh, we had a very clear vision. We would explain to them where we are trying to go. And all the tactics would be clearly explained what our objectives were for that particular period, how we were going to attain. Short-term annual objectives, measurement and visual charting. And we had charts all over. And every time, um, you know, uh, where we would hit a target or break a record, we would celebrate. And the results and financial attainment was discussed a bit. There was nothing confidential in the company. It was complete transparency. The only thing that we did not, uh, you know, it, uh, disclose what everyone's salary amount. And I, personally, I had no problems doing that, but it would just create, uh, you know, unfortunately, something like that creates issues. So that was the only item which was private, but all our other financial numbers were completely uh, open. Uh, provide business literacy, which is an extremely important part of, of, of this endeavor. Uh, business terms and basics, understand financial business constraints, better decisions and less weight. Very often the employee would come back and say, hey, um, Ed, we, um, they would call me Ed at work and say that we ship more pounds uh, this month, but we made less profit. You know, and, and ask questions like that and then say, yeah, but most of the pounds we shipped were to a company which uh, where the margins are very low. And, uh, you know, we didn't ship enough of this high margin uh, product. Uh, better decisions and less weight. It's amazing. We would, our uh, engineers would come up with 50,000, 70,000 uh, type of capital projects to improve uh, some sort of material handling or doing something. And the uh, employees would come back and say, um, don't waste your money. I've got a better idea. And if you listen to them, in a lot of cases, it made a lot of sense and, and we benefited. Empower employees. Employees have substantial say in their own work. Work team huddles. The employees would meet once a week in, in that particular work group and discuss what they needed. Uh, and if there's something uh, they needed as far as tools, better equipment, uh, they would let us know about it, how they could improve efficiency. They'd discuss it and, and decide on some experimentation on their own. And we encouraged this. And, and if there were some failures, we accepted it as learning experience. Again, continuous improvement was the name of the game. Have a stake in the success of the company, build enthusiasm and positive peer pressure. That's extremely important, positive peer pressure. As I mentioned before, the momentum was towards doing less and less. With this system with uh, profit sharing, essentially the good employee would keep on doing good and doing the best and put pressure on the marginal employee to improve and do better. So the entire momentum shift towards doing better and better. Celebrate successes. Um, we've, we've done everything you can possibly do in New Jersey. We've had lunches, we've taken the employees and the spouses. Every time, whatever we did was with the spouse. We have gone to great adventure. We went to medieval times. We've taken cruises around uh, Manhattan. So you name it and we've done it. At one point, we had seven years without a lost time accident, which is, and the amount of money, uh, you know, you save that translates to savings is unbelievable. Share in the financial successes and which I've already uh, talked about. So why does it work? Common goals outweigh parochial ones. It focuses attention like a laser on objectives. It facilitates innovation and continuous improvement, helps managers lead rather than manage. You lead by example. 
And many, many times it was a 24 seven operation. And sometimes in the night shift, something would break down or maybe there was a, an accident. And, and I would go in, there's nothing I could do there, but essentially it was moral support that people felt that I cared enough to come in. And, and that had tremendous motivational impact. Financial reward, catalyst motivation and peer pressure, sources of mistrust and uh, <clears throat> resentment almost vanish. Each employee behaves as a valued customer, as an entrepreneur. And then once you start seeing these successes, it's amazing how more and more things come on. So what were some of the hurdles and challenges? Okay. One is it should fit in with your culture. I mean, if you're depending on your company's culture, you choose the uh, programs or you choose the initial um, rewards accordingly. As I mentioned to you, we were very sports-minded and everything we looked at was like a game. You have to have a sound vision, good planning, and you know, innovative execution. I mean, you can theoretically talk about it, but how you execute it is extremely important. Lead by example. Okay, sound vision, maintain focus and lead by example. Very, very important. You have to walk the talk here. You know. Biggest challenge was to keep this open book ma management and the employee incentive award center stage and prevent it from becoming an entitlement. Uh, this we had to be very careful of. We keep, firstly with the union, we said it's it's about the union contract. It'll never become part of the union contract. We will change it whenever and however we want it. Okay. So we kept it as a separate program. And by the time we ended up, we reduced the free, first three criteria. And if you remember the performance error criteria, which was 25, we increased that to 40%. We were very conscious of not making it an individual award because we didn't, didn't want competition and one shift uh, trying to get good production and hurting the second shift. So it was always a, a cost center or departmental performance. Yesterday's past performance is no guarantee of future success. We had to be careful of that. We were doing so well that uh, I was concerned about hubris and overconfidence setting in and becoming dangerous, and that can become lethal. You know. Today's challenges, I, we used to use this word all the time. You have to earn your wings every day. You know, okay, you did something great yesterday, which was fine. Now you have to do something great today also. Tomorrow, new opportunities to pursue beyond resources available, and it's a new challenge. So sort of in, in, in summary, it was magic at AccuPowder. Our EIA payouts exceeded about $10,000 per year per employee. In 10 years, we doubled our annual revenues from 50 million to 100 million with the same number of employees. We were very liberal in, in giving awards and having fun, but we were very, very tight on adding employees. One employee saved would take care of, you know, almost a year of, of all these awards that we were doing. So we were very tight and we stayed at 18. We were exporting to countries like India, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, while everyone was worried about foreign competition, uh, we were able to uh, export specialized products to these places. Uh, and even to China, and what happened was a lot of large companies, where US companies were setting, plan, setting up plants in China. And if they were using our powders, they wanted to use the same powders in, in China. So it was a, a good way of, of doing that. And they were so afraid about uh, you know, Chinese uh, stealing their knowledge that when we would ship copper powder, they wouldn't even call it copper powder. It would call uh, ingredient A or ingredient B. But it was, it was good export business for us. Our market share had increased from 19% to 40%. We had sufficient retained earnings to facilitate the buyout of a smaller competitor, which added another 10% to take our market share to over 50%. And the most important uh, thing I was proud of, as I mentioned to you that these self-lubricating bearings are used in multiple appliances in every household, uh, bronze uh, bearings. 
and we had 50% market share. So I was confident that our powder was existed in every single household in North America. Okay, so that was an immense uh, feeling of accomplishment. So in conclusion, uh, open book entrepreneurship is a powerful concept and tool. It can be utilized in almost any business environment. Fine tune it to meet your needs. We hope it'll be magic to you also. Good luck. With that, um, I think I've, I've, I could go on talking on it for, for hours uh, on special issues, but I think this gives you an overall uh, idea of, of, of what open book entrepreneurship is about. And I'd be more than happy to take um, questions. Thank you, Adol. Uh, we've had quite a few questions coming in uh, while you were speaking. So uh, uh, I'm not sure how you want to do it. Maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Karishma uh, Koka, who has a question. Uh, Karishma, would you like to ask the question? Or would you like me to ask the question? No. All right, so we shall, I, I shall ask the question uh, once I find it, of course. Okay, I'll do it, Javed. Adel, in your, thank you, Javed. It's very, very encouraging what you've said because I've also seen you apply this to the development of the Zoroastrian faculty network in action, actually seeing you apply all these principles. However, when you took on a company that was an old plant, how did you balance information, risk, and intuition? Um. Well, what we were doing initially was a lot by experience and in intuition. Okay? Uh, risk factors, I, I mentioned to you, in any business, anything we do, risk is always involved. Uh, I mentioned very often that even crossing the road involves risk. Okay, If you close your eyes and cross the road, you're taking a gamble. Okay, If you look left and right and cross the road, you're taking a calculated risk. So it's the same concept. You you weigh the risks. Now, obviously, everyone would weigh the risk differently. Um, you know, people were very concerned that we had a very, very old plan. And uh, there were a lot of environmental issues. And, and that was probably one of the biggest risk, risk factors. Uh, but again, uh, it was a calculated risk. I'd worked with the company. I knew the background. Uh, the other thing is that Alcan had agreed to clean the plant and bring it up to the current environmental standards, okay? In fact, I, I give, relate to you a, a, um, a little bit of the, a problem that, that even created. Uh, the soil was cleaned up very quickly. Uh, we, in 1970s, we stopped producing lead powder, cadmium powder, which were very hazardous materials. The soil with the limits was so low that there was no way we could produce it. So we discontinued producing it in the 1970s. The land was cleaned up. And uh, basically there was water contamination because in the production of aluminum paste, there was mineral spirits used, hydrocarbons. They had tanks underground. Uh, over 50, 60 years, there was always some leakage. So there was water, water contamination. So there was going to be a, a water recovery system which Alcan was supposed to put up. Now, what happened was just before we were about to start, uh, this would take probably 10 years to, to resolve. Um, Alcan uh, Cooperation, which is the US headquarters in New Jersey. Uh, my boss was from there. And he basically decided that uh, if the new company was going to pay for the installation of the water system and uh, maintenance of the water system, and I, I basically said, sorry, that wasn't the deal. You know, the deal was that you were going to take care of it. He said, yeah, but, you know, we I had emails and, and discussions and on record, but uh, no formal contract was signed. So he said, sorry, we've changed our mind. This, this is the way it's going to be if you want to buy the company. So I, I actually uh, risked my job. He could easily have fired me, but I went straight to the Alcan Aluminium Worldwide President in Montreal. And, I, and I, I, want, I wanted to meet with him. Uh, it's an interesting, it, I'm thinking a little longer than I wanted, but it was an interesting experience. Um, 
spoke to his secretary, uh, Maria. He said, okay, come on Friday. He's got half an hour between 12 and 12.30. And so I was there before 12 o'clock, waited till the 12 o'clock, 12.10, 12.15. Jacques Bougie was the president's name. He never came out. So Maria said, he's got another meeting at 12.30. Let me go out and bring him up. Go into the meeting and bring him out. He, she actually went into the meeting that was going on, brought him out. We spoke five minutes in the corridor. And essentially I said, Jacques, this was not the deal. Please, uh, we, we need to do it. So I'm, I must compliment him. He said, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. Okay. He spoke to the person who had originally ne negotiated a deal, Ken Wright, who had already retired. I guess they got in contact with them. He said the intent was quite clear that Alcan would pick up the cost. So he reversed the decision of Hackbert. But I had to be extremely careful with what I did from that point because Hackbert could easily have fired me at any moment. <laughs> you know, and obviously he, he, he lost a lot of face. So sometimes I, I, you have to really um, take a big, big risk, so to speak, if you want to uh, make it work, you know. So you're constantly balancing risk with intuition and, and uh, results, you know. Thanks, Adal. Now, we have a we have a question, um, in fact, a couple of questions that you may want to take at the same time. The first question was, uh, how much did you personally invest uh, in this company? And the second slightly related to that question comes from Natalie Gandhi, which is, um, is it possible for WZCC to buy back your company and, and benefit from, uh, from its growth prospects? Why would we do that? So I, if you could answer both of them at the same time, it might yeah. help. Yeah, essentially the total uh, capital we put in was 200,000. Uh, my portion of it was 100,000. So all I put into was uh, 100,000, okay? But as I said, we had an uh, extremely we, uh, heavy debt load. Okay. Sure. Um, <clears throat> And when it was time to, to sell, actually a private equity company came after us. We were talking about it. Most of the partners were over 65 years old. Uh, we had a couple of strategic uh, competitors look at it uh, to put personally, you know, to consider uh, um, buying it. Um, but we weren't that enthused about the offers. But then we got this private equity come in and the private equity company had already bought one of our competitors, uh, SCM products in uh, uh, Carolinas, and they wanted to roll up and were quite interested in getting up. In, their offer literally was almost double of, of what uh, a, a competitive company would, would had offered. Okay? So even though I did not, my first choice was not to sell to private equity, but you know, the ma margin was so different that um, we decided to go ahead. Um, everyone, at the time of sale, everyone who had originally said, why are you buying the company was now saying, why are you selling the company? Uh, so I guess we were going against the trend. We, we saw it was time to, you know, as I said, uh, age was getting high. Uh, basically, the offer was uh, very good. Uh, so the timing was perfect. And now also just keep in mind that we sold the company in 2010 and 2008 and 2009 were terrible years. Okay, those were the recession. Uh, you remember we had a major recession in 2008, 2009. Um, luckily, the, the way the recession happened was that the first half of 2008 was quite good. Second half was very bad. So we ended up with sort of a, almost a zero profit year. The opposite happened in 2009. The first half was very bad. The second half was good. So we again ended up with a sort of a break-even year. Luckily, everything didn't happen in one year. Okay. So we, we told the private uh, equity company that we would only sell if you did not consider it's two years. You've got our history for the last 10 years. So take the numbers of 2005, six, and seven, but uh, you know, don't take 2008 and two. And, and they sort of did that, and, and which also encouraged us to do the sale. Um, and, and, and Natalie, I don't think it makes, uh, <laughs> it'd be very difficult to buy it back. What happened is that this private equity company bought a third company uh, called Eka, 
uh, Granules, which is a German company. So now they had a mini multinational with AccuPowder, SCM, and Hecker. And just recently, Platinum Equity sold this group of three companies to another private equity called Palladium. So now it's part of a bigger group. And I, I don't think there's an opportunity to go back to, to buy AccuPowder, you know. Okay. Uh, thanks, Edgar. Uh, we've had a few more questions coming in, but uh, some of the early questions. The first one is from Mr. Viraf Debu. Uh, and he's asked, what are the challenges and what things didn't go as planned or didn't go as well as expected? So very, very important. When I tell the story, sometimes it you know, looks, sounds like it was really easy. Everything went so well. But the first problem I already explained that we were almost knocked out of the deal and uh, done it. Uh, 2008, 2009 was a major, major challenge. Okay. Um, we went to a four day schedule. You know, we didn't have enough um, production. So from a seven day rotating schedule, we went to a, a four day schedule because the volumes had dropped. We, we made a concerted effort to, to keep the volume as high as possible. We were literally operating at no profit, but we wanted to keep the plant running. So at least we covered our costs, okay? Now the union, basically under this sort of scenario, you would lay off the junior most employees and you would keep the senior most employees. Okay, what we basically told them was, look, in the good times we've shared all our, you know, successes. In bad times, we need to share all our problems. So let's forget about layoff, the junior people. Let's all of us go to a four day schedule with 80% of your salary, we cut. However, when this recession is over, okay, we will, you know, people who've accepted this, we will pay back the amount that was cut later on, okay? So, which means that if you went to a four-day schedule and you worked only for four days, then you would get nothing later on. But if you, you went to a four-day schedule, but you continue to work five days, working out, helping out, cleaning, painting, doing whatever we want, uh, we would utilize you for the fifth day, and then again, when the recession got over, we would pay you back the 20%. Now that required them to really trust management. We had extremely good uh, credibility. And I was actually surprised that the union went along with that offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and another item which I should have mentioned somewhere along the line, that it, it got, you know, the cooperation was so good that I, at one point I had the union president coming to me and saying, Hey, Ed, better have your supervisor look at Joe Bloke because he's goofing off and you're and nothing's happening. So at that point, I knew that the union was just there in name. You know, it, it, it they weren't really doing anything. And the entire period, we only had, uh, you know, we you had multiple grievances, but we settled most of them with compromises. We only had two grievances that went to arbitration, and both the company won. Uh, and basically, uh, my philosophy was that you bend over backwards to compromise. There's no point in going to arbitration. It's a lose-lose situation. Um, but there were two extreme cases that we went. So anyway, for in the long period, that that showed uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, cooperation from. I mean, what we were doing, I felt was working. You know, and uh, let's see, another important. Um, uh, problem that we had, which I should mention, is that this flat structure had a lot of uh, advantages and keeping employees at the minimum level. But uh, the problem with that was we had no succession plan. Okay. Uh, and that was uh, a weak point of anything like this that you're doing. You're operating so lean that if something goes wrong with one of the employees, you don't have a backup, you don't have a succession plan. Uh, our uh, uh, VP of Finance, uh, Michael Kudry, um, was probably the most sports-oriented person in our company. We played a lot of tennis together. We had a lot of fun. He and his sons were, were taking part in the New York triathlon. He was doing the swimming part of it, and his son was do doing the running and the bicycling or whatever. 
something went wrong in the swimming portion and he passed away. He died in during this triathlon in New York City. So overnight, we suddenly were without a vice president of finance and we had no idea uh, a lot of the things that how where he kept it, where the things were. And it, it was an, literally a nightmare for six months to get a handle on, on um, you know, uh, financial records and things like that, you know. So th that's another uh, a major problem of that we had. Okay. There's another question, uh, this time from uh, Percy Master, which was from which year did you start making profits? And after sharing 20%, what was the amount left for shareholders or the owners? Yeah, uh, we, we made profit from day one, Percy. Okay. Um, you know, and we were supposed to make this thing happen in 95. We had a closing date set up for uh, September. We went to the law firm in New York with all the paperwork and something was missing. I don't exactly know what, but some on Alcan's part, uh, some way paperwork that was required was not there. So that got canceled. And I was hoping that it would take, you know, in October, November, December, and it just kept dragging out. You know, this wasn't a very big priority for Alcam. But then someone decided it had to happen in 95. So all of a sudden, December 20, you know, second, third week of December, rush, 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 we have to get it closed. So 29th of December, now I was supposed to go to India at that time for my uh, niece's uh, wedding. So I had to postpone that. Uh, I, the, the family left, I was alone. 29th of December, we closed. I bought a new company. I left for India on the 30th. So this is sort of a big joke. You bought a company on the 29th and you left for India on the 30th. So I went there for one week, came back on January 7th. But so some of the months was a little close because our comfort, you know, the extra money that we had was about a million dollars of working capital, which was extra. Uh, so we had to watch very closely how our receivables were, customers were paying. Uh, at one point, we gave a discount to uh, some of our customers to get the money early. Um, but we were able to balance the books. The first six months, it was tight, but we ended the year positive. And, um, you know, um, we grew. Now, you can calculate. Uh, the other question, I think, was what was left for you? So, you know, I, I mentioned that uh, typically, we were paying out a million dollars um, in EIA, which was 20%. So essentially, we were making about four to five million a year. 20% of that would be one million. Okay. So that was a sort of a um, um, profitability. Uh, we didn't uh, really, all the money was going back into returned earnings. I mean, the partners were getting their salary, what we considered salary was continuing. If they were eligible for bonuses, they would get their bonuses, but no, um, you know, retained earnings were being distributed. Okay, all of it was going to reduce our borrowings. And when we bought the uh, second company, we again borrowed more. So there was always some borrowing left. We were we were never at a point where our borrowing was zero. You know? Thanks, Ada. There's another question, uh, this time by someone called Zoom user. Uh, so I can't attribute it to anyone, but uh, the question was, how do you criticize problem employees? I presume it's in the context of uh, open book management. Yeah, I mean, uh, if the person is doing extremely badly, we had a very uh, rigid procedure because it was a, a, a union. So you would Basically, if someone uh, did something which was, you know, terribly wrong, he would get first a verbal warning. Second step was a written warning. Third step was a suspension. Fourth step would be a firing. Now you had to go through so many steps that, it, uh, you know, you, you never got to the firing stage. Uh, uh, hopefully he improved long, long before that. Uh, the only, only time uh, employee would, you know, he would take drastic action if he did something really long 
wrong, like he was stealing something from the company or he threatened the supervisor or, or something major like that. But for work performance, we would always work with the employee and improve them. And, and really there was enough peer pressure. You know, every group had what we called a group leader. And the group leader was an Ali employee, a union employee, but he was responsible for his three-man, four-man group. So there was there was actually self-monitoring. The supervisors, uh, you know, only got involved by exception. And um, uh, basically, we just had one supervisor for the entire plant on the each shift. And as you can see, we had like yeah, about eight different departments. So he couldn't really uh, babysit with every department and the and the early employees group leader uh, was handling it. Uh, the, the, the other, um, so basically, if there was a marginal employee, we would work with him. If some training was needed, we would apply it. We would have peer pressure. We would have uh, warnings. Um, and and most of the time it, it worked, okay? There were very few cases. Uh, a typical employee with us was, 20 years, 25 years. I mean, if you were below 20 years, you were considered a junior. Now this had advantages that you had a lot of experience, but it also had a disadvantage that new blood was not coming in. Okay, so it had pluses and, and, and minuses. We would have a father working for the company, the son working for the company, son-in-law working for the company. So we would have, you know, from the same company, it was, wasn't unusual to have three or four people working uh, there. So we have another question, Ada, which is, I think we've spoken about this previously, uh, about the impact on unions. But interestingly enough, uh, Sunnu wants to ask, what was the impact on the other uh, businesses in your local area? In 2008, 2009? No, I suspect uh, to do with the way you managed your business. Uh, did other oh, people kind of follow it using OBM or I presume yeah. that's what was asked. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, uh, I mean, um, we, we didn't really have that much uh, connection with uh, other businesses like in, a, in, in Union Township. There was a lot of different businesses in different fields. Um, within a, a competitor group, uh, you know, people heard about it, but none of our competitors uh, we didn't try to promote it with them. You know, it, it was sort of, uh, I, I would think, a competitive advantage we had. Um, but but they were certainly aware that we were doing something differently and it was working. Um, but as far as I know, none of them introduced that um, program, um, you know, um, that, I, that I'm aware of. Uh, I would love to see um, some of our uh, Zarsusti um, companies. Uh, you can do it. Uh, manufacturing, it's very uh, direct and uh, beneficial, but I think you can even do it in the service industry. There's no reason why you couldn't do it in an office environment. Uh, same type of thing, you offer uh, a share in, in the success, so you celebrate, and, and, and I think it has a tremendous motivational tool. Uh, we would send, send the annual uh, income statement, we would mail it to the home, and it will be done in a very pictorial way, you know, like, okay, this is our uh, net revenue and this is our expenses, this is our gross profit, these are our SR and AE, this is our net profit. And we wanted uh, employees, uh, families to look at it. And, and that was something Southwest Air was doing and we actually copied that from them. So um, it was, you know, if you saw something good someone else was doing, we, we were not uh, shy about copying it and, and benefiting from it. Um, some more questions. I think they've, I'm trying to now uh, theme them where possible. So we have uh, someone called S. Karma who has asked, how long did it take you to build trust? Uh, and we also have Professor Zubin Setna from the UK uh, asking, what was the first reaction when you decided to do this? Was there disbelief that people, was other people enthusiastic? Presumably the shareholders had a different reaction to the employees. So I think it's all about trust and you know yeah. the reaction yeah. that you've had to this. Yeah, uh, I started at, at Alcan as a uh, R&D metallurgist, research and development metallurgist. From there, I became a customer service technical uh, uh, specialist, so to speak. 
Uh, at that point, I'd done my MBA and I, I then wanted to get into management and I became a production manager. And from there, a plant manager. And then, so I'd worked with the employees over the years. Okay. So it wasn't someone new who just came in and said, I'm, you know, and became the, the boss. And in, in a lot of these cases, I, uh, I'd known the employees and even their families. And uh, when we were buying the company, we finally went with IBJ Schroeder, which is Industrial Bank of Japan Schroeder. And the case manager was uh, James McConnell. And he, would, he had spent time in the plant and um, talking to the employees. And when he came back to me and he, and he said, uh, again, Ed, uh, your business plan is great. It's got a lot of numbers, but believe me, your numbers aren't going to come true. You'll either do better, you'll do worse, <laughs> but your numbers are just numbers. The reason I'm giving you uh, approving this loan is is one is I, I I like you. The people in the plant trust you. I've spoken to them. Uh, you know they they trust you. And two, no one in the right mind is going to build a plant like this today. So the, <laughs> that was his rationale for giving us the. The, the loan. Uh, so I, I, to some extent, I had trust and credibility even before I, I, I took over. Okay, so that certainly uh, helped a lot. Um, they were not terribly surprised. In fact, a couple of times, you know, people uh, when they knew that Alcan had was sort of losing interest and might be selling the division, uh, they, some of them had casually actually mentioned to me that, why don't you consider uh, buying it? So it, it, it didn't come as a surprise to them. We were quite open about it from, from so, uh, you know, we didn't do the deal and then suddenly announce it. Um, they knew about it, you know, two years ahead of time uh, while this environmental remediation was going on and things were progressing. So we gradually merged into it. Uh, even even our competition knew this was happening, and the big joke was like, "When will it happen?" You said you're going to take over, but when is it happening? You know, it, it, because it dragged out because of the environmental um, um, situation. But we, but we had the patience; we stayed with it, and and it got it done. Sure, we've got a flurry of questions coming in. Um, the first one is around network. Apparently, one of your buzzwords for the WZCC has been all about network, network, network. And so, uh, Nosha Contractor has asked, could you give us some examples of that advice in the context of your experiences with AccuPowder uh, International? Yeah. Another question I... uh, includes the network you built up with your colleagues, also included providing backup in times of difficulty. Please tell us how you looked after your employees. That's from Jaru and Karishma Poka. Okay, first the networking. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs have to network all the time. Uh, you need to know where you need to go to to get what you need. Okay, so first you need to know exactly what you want, and then you need to know where to go to get it. But for that, you, you should already have a sort of a network built up. Um, I was very involved with every aspect of, of powder metallurgy. Uh, we had a New York chapter. I was the uh, president of the New York chapter, I would organize meetings so everyone I, I knew. I kept in touch with India, with my old professors. I was very close to the Indian powder metallurgy com community. I would attend their annual meetings. Um, we've supplied free samples of powders to IIT Bombay. And interestingly, our powder um, also went to IIT Kanpur, and there was a, a Professor Upadaya who actually did some, uh, wanted to do some research work, and I thought our powder was on an experiment on the Indian space shuttle, which they were doing some experimentation. So I can, we could claim, you know, so that was all networking, you know, you give your samples out to different, different people. So when you needed some help, I would call up my professor, I would call up uh, people in India. I would even, uh, you know, we had our annual meeting, um, MPIF meeting, where we would meet and and I would be playing tennis with my competitors. You know, we would have a com competitor a company's president, I would be playing tennis with them. And, and quite often, I, um, as long as you don't talk to them about pricing and price fixing and things like that. There's nothing wrong in talking to your competitors. Uh, for example, uh, 
um, we shared information about the labor union contract and and that came about because of uh, of, of networking uh, I, I wanted a uh, someone a shipping agent and i would say ask some you know my competitor who are you using you know do you have someone to recommend so uh, I had dr german randall who was a very a big authority in in powder metallurgy at penn state and i, I knew him and any time a research project came up um, we would uh, ask him you know we did no fundamental research the only research we did at acupowder was uh, applied research where we would develop things in conjunction with the, uh, the customer so if we had to do something we would give a small project to um, a university to do it okay so we, we used no consultants we stayed away from consultants uh, we, we couldn't afford them to so to speak uh, but we got the same work done by because of our uh, network you know sure um, another question i think you briefly mentioned pricing uh, someone called Porus has asked, uh, what different pricing strategies did you use to surpass your competitors? Um, very flexible pricing strategy. Okay, if the product was uh, uh, specialized, we obviously uh, tried to optimize our margins and, and uh, get in. Um, if the product was a commodity, uh, we wanted to be sure that our plant was loaded so we went with some of our big customers and justified it on volume and we would sell it very very low margins but we had to be sure that we had to get a certain amount of volume to keep our plant loaded this gives gave us a, a consistency of operation so we had everyone from very low margins to to very high margins so it depended on the application depended on the customer depended on the competition but these large customers we would would not let our competitors get them you know there were like two or three base customers and they knew that you know if if they got a you know offer from them for like one penny lower than our uh price they would come to come to us and and uh you know we would we would match it or they would ignore it as being too small uh so our pricing was extremely uh flexible um if someone we had a price list if someone came to you know just ordered material through our sales administration they got the price list and that was the fixed price but if they came through our sales managers and depending uh, we had four competitors so essentially there were four people in the field we had a well-defined list of about 250 customers so all four competitors knew all 250 uh, you know users so it was specialized but very competitive okay. Okay. but there's we had some yeah sorry there's a slightly rhetorical question from natalie gandhi which is why did you wait so so long to tell us all of this stuff uh, and then uh, karishma has also asked is there a way that we can you know do this is there a way that we, you could teach this uh, more formally perhaps uh, to people because it's so interesting there were yeah. lots of, uh, lots of no, no, in 2005 i'd done it at london <laughs> okay yeah, uh, yeah. so it, it wasn't brand new I've, I've talked about it in fact i was going to apologize today so the old timers might have heard it before so it'll be sort of a, a repeat for them um but then during the w uh, zcc years you know we wanted to bring new speakers i think um Karishma had sort of asked me to speak on it. I said, not now, Karishma. Maybe once I'm done with WZCC, we can talk about it, you know. Um, and, and the opportunity came up very quickly because of Dorab, who we talked about it. So uh, people have heard bits and pieces of it in, in, in different formats. So it's not something brand new to do. Okay, what is the second, uh, sorry, uh, related to that? Um, no, there, there's a question that's come through from Kesho uh, Kambata saying, how can we motivate our Zoroastrian youth to get into a business of their own and have an opportunity to be an owner of their own business? I mean, we've been working on that for six years. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's tough, you know. Uh, people said, uh, provide added value products, which the youth want, okay? So we whatever they wanted, we tried to provide, okay? Um, speed, you know, um, whatever meeting in the format that they want 
Okay, they wanted financing. We made financing available. Uh, they wanted, so we made all the things that they asked for available. Uh, it has worked in the sense that some people are taking advantage of it, but we would certainly uh, would like more people to consider it and get involved. Uh, people in in uh, abroad are doing a lot of things and there are a lot of small scale businesses. We've given loans to three people um, and the two in the in the wings. So, but they they're not coming in droves. And and I, and I, the way I look at it is one 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 person at a time. Uh, people from Bangalore, uh, Pune, and all seem to be very active. Uh, we get this question off very often: uh, Why are the, the youth from uh, Mumbai different <laughs> to the others? And 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 I think entitlement is is part of the problem that they've gotten used to a certain extent of entitlement. They expect everyone else to help them, and and they're satisfied with what they have. And um, but we're trying, working hard at it constantly. You know, it's a tough battle. Of course, he's going to have to take it from here on and continue the effort. You know, we formed ZFN for that reason. We are encouraging people to do take higher, do higher education abroad. Uh, we've got the ZF, which is the financing arm. So we, we have taken steps and, and you can only take the horse to the <laughs> lake to, uh, you know, for, they, they have to finally make the decision to drink the water. <laughs> I mean, if anyone's got suggestions, we are very open to it. Uh, any anything we're missing or anything we can do differently, we would certainly like to try that. Yeah. I mean, there, there are. But I think it's stories like this and other success stories when people hear. Uh, yeah. In in my case, uh, it was um, you know my grandfather's father was uh, was involved. He was um, started the central bank. I would hear stories about him at our dining table. My mother would talk about it. So there was some uh, in, inspiration and, and motivation. Um, so if people ha have a um, figure that um, or know about someone in their family, if parents talk about it on the dining table, uh, that'll help. You know, I mean, in India, we talk about your, join an engineering college or become a doctor or become a lawyer. Uh, I don't think the parents, the young parents may not even know what entrepreneurship exactly is. So they can talk about it on the dining table, and and that's another effort that we're trying to do is is to try to get young parents understand what entrepreneurship is. I think it's also important for people to understand that there are you don't have to be born with a you know with a with a huge amount of money to be successful in business. And I think leverage buyouts, MBOs, angel investors, all of that is available uh, not just in the West but also in India and also through the WZCC. So I think it's quite important for people to actually realize that there are sources of funding. There are uh, another question which seems interesting. Uh, are you involved in any new companies or projects? This comes from Zoom user again. New companies, no projects, yes. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> essentially, um, you know, I, I, I when I retired in uh, uh, 2010, we sold the company. I worked for two years and, and, and then pretty much uh, dropped down. And um, I, I have done some voluntary consultation, if you want. Uh, a lot of people in India have asked me for advice and, I've, and I've, I mean, and offered to pay for it. But basically I said, look, I'll, I'll help you. I'll work with you. I don't want any money. Um, basically, I, I don't want the responsibility, to, so to speak. I'll give you what I know, and um, and actually, uh, uh, just on a basis, one of the companies I worked with uh, in India did um, quite well with, with with my advice. I'd gone to India. I, I spent two days with him, and he said, "Goodness sake, Adel, in two days you solved what we've been struggling for for uh, you know years," and and essentially he was so appreciative that he regularly donates to our Daremir. Uh, you know, we have a fund uh, and in New York, Daremir. And I said, if you want to, want to give me any, if you want to monetary compensate me, you can donate to our Daremir. And he's been doing that now, you know, on a regular basis. Okay. 
I think we've got to the point where uh, projects, yes, sir. Projects are Javed, yeah. Yes, sir. I spent six years pretty much on our new Dharam after <laughs> retirement. I spent another six years with WZCC. We still got WZCC going. We've we've got the Generation Z project going. Um, we have we have uh, uh, you know we've got the World Congress coming up. So I'm I'm into a lot of projects. Uh, uh, keeps me busy at least eight hours a, a day with something or the other. So sure. we've got uh, Kesha Khambata again uh, offering him and his wife Nazneen's help to any Zoroastrian who wants to set up a business in the U.S and also help them to understand how financing works in the US. So, you know, Kesha. Thank you, Kesha. We appreciate it, back, Kesha. Has, uh, it might be has already, yeah. yeah. I mean, through WZCC, we had forwarded some uh, young graduates. He has uh, employed them. We are very appreciative of it. And he, uh, Kesha, thank you for all the work you're doing in that regard, you know. There's another comment about the role of the spouse. Uh, Adel, would you like to comment a little bit about support from the spouse, etc.? Someone very, else is asking very, about yeah. the stress of the business. Did you have a dedicated strategy? Uh, very, very important. Uh, if you go into business, please make sure that your wife is uh, supportive upfront. You don't want it to break up your marriage. <laughs> You know, uh, when we, when I was uh, uh, going to do this, we we talked about it. Nilofa and myself talked about it, and she said, "What's the worst thing I can happen?" I said, "Basically, um, you know, we would uh, lose what we have built so far, but we have my education, we have a degree, and we would start over again." And uh, I personally am not afraid of it. And 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 but the and her response was. Um, Let's go for it. I know you. If you were not sure of it, you wouldn't do it. So that was her response, which certainly helped me. Um, you spend a lot, of, a lot of hours uh, at work, so then uh, you know family work balance is always difficult. Uh, I made it a point to take a vacation every year. Uh, I did not get into the rut of you know I can't take a vacation because I'm busy at work. It, you know, a couple of weeks of vacation was uh, standard known. Fix the date. Everything else you can organize around it, <laughs> you know. So uh, from that point of view, I, I did it. But on a daily basis, uh, there are sacrifices that uh, you you make, and and your spouse has to pick up the slack, so to speak, you know. But definitely, um, if if there's a major conflict there, or if she doesn't want to do it, um, you know, I I would say it's it's not worth risking your marriage for it. Thank you, Eder. I think we'll open up the call now to anyone who wants to have a general chat. Um, Before we do that, can I thank Adel? Sure. Javed? sure. Adel, thank you so much. It's, as Natalie said, you've hidden this aspect of your management and your career. And um, I think everyone is very surprised how successful this was. And it was very innovative. Um, but as they say, the message remains the same, but the audience changes. And I'm glad we did this seminar with you because people, there are new people on board and they've never heard this before. And it was an, an absolute excellent presentation. So thank you. Um, and um, we hope that you may uh, in fact expand on this in the future. So there may be another webinar inside you, Adal, for us to uh, explore. So thank you so much. Uh, Javed, you. would you like to open this up now? You're on mute, Javed. Ah, uh, yes, right. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to open it up. Um, and we, we can, we can Pause the recording as well. So if you if you feel uncomfortable, then you can ask any questions you want to.